What you see on the screen is a term that people were not familiar with up until the year 2013. Very quickly, media frenzy caught up with the same dilemma and the phenomenon was known as a selfie. By the end of the year 2013, the Oxford English Dictionary labeled it as the word of the year. Wow, that must really tell you something about this word. The word is selfie. The Oxford Dictionary includes it in the dictionary and calls it the word of the year. Some take it too far. I've, 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 I've gone around, I've seen some friends, and I've seen how they are, they are grappled by this amazing phenomenon. Everyone wants to take a selfie. Uh, I saw on the news the other day there was a selfie taken at the Oscars. You all know that very well. I know that. And everyone was there. There was a great hype about it. But some have really taken it too far. The, the obsession with this is, is, is phenomenal. Take a look at this. Some are so obsessed with it that if it were possible, I'd like to lie in the grave and still take a selfie of myself. It's amazing. It's amazing how far this, this, this selfish phenomenon has gone. But this morning, my friends, we'd like to redefine this phrase called selfie and redefine it with the theme of your Bible camp this weekend. Everybody talks about self. The, the, whole, the whole criteria in this phenomenon that has captured the world is about self. Self has to be exalted. I have to look good. I have to pose well. I have to be attractive. I have to be more appealing. Every focus and every thought is gauged upon self. When I remember the story of the fall of a great and mighty angel by the name Lucifer, I don't see heaven reminding me that his sin was adultery. I don't see heaven reminding me either that, you know, he stole something. I don't either see heaven reminding me also that he was gluttonous, he liked to eat a lot. No. The Bible tells me that the man's problem was self. He wanted self to be exalted all the time. If there's one person who would have enjoyed selfies, I know it would be Lucifer. He couldn't stop thinking of self. He couldn't stop exalting himself. Look where it got him. I pray that we may be more careful when we talk about this term, selfie. And hence, this morning, we'd like to redefine this term selfie in a whole new paradigm that we might not have appreciated in the past. And so our subject this morning, selfie with my FB. We want to spend some self-time with our FB, not our Facebook or our phones, but our favorite book, the favorite gospel message that the Lord has presented unto us. Through this Bible camp, we want to understand the power that there is in the Word. We want to reconnect, plug in, and experience the power that there is in the Gospel message. We'd like to understand how do we unlock the power that there is in this ministry, the power that there is in the study of the Scriptures. How do we get packed up with this great and blessed occasion? This morning, we're going to take a look at the story of Philip and the eunuch. Have you heard of this story? It's a very, it's a very common story. Have you heard of the story? This morning, we're going to learn how to read our Bibles from a non-believer. How does that sound? We're going to learn how to read and study our Bibles, and we're going to learn that from a non-believer, the eunuch. We're going to look at the eunuch and learn what should we do? How do we spend more time? Where should I be? What should I do to be able to grasp? and glean and understand from the scriptural message. It's fascinating when I went through the story. It was fascinating to know that I could actually learn something from a non-believer. 
The man had no idea about who God was. And yet, he knew how to read the Bible. Did he understand what he was reading? Not exactly. But he knew the whereabouts of how to read the Bible. Let's, let's turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. A very fascinating incident. See, this afternoon we're going to continue our discussion. And while right now I'm, I'm, I'm throwing you down into Acts 8, in the afternoon I'm going to take you back to Acts chapter 2. And what happened in Acts chapter 2 and the, and the, the great experience that surrounds Acts chapter 2. We're going to talk about that this afternoon. What you have to understand in Acts chapter 8 is that chronologically moving from Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 2 there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit is outpoured, God's people, there were 120 of them in the upper room on whom the Holy Spirit came and rested and possessed. These people having been filled with the Holy Ghost now are excited to preach the gospel message. You know, if you understand something about Philip, who we're going to talk about, when you go to John chapter 1, in John chapter 1, Philip meets Jesus. Okay? Philip has a conversation with Jesus. He comes and tells Nathaniel, his best friend, about Jesus. But when he is describing Jesus to Nathaniel, he says, Philip, uh, we have found him. Nathaniel says, who? We have found him of whom the prophets talked about. We have found him whom of the Bible talked about, whom Moses wrote about. We have found him. Who is it, Philip? Well, he is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, now, when you read the book Desire of Ages, I don't know why it explains that when Philip introduces Christ to Nathaniel, he introduces him with, a, with faith, but with trembling faith. He's not completely sure about who Jesus is. But in Nathaniel's experience with him, Nathaniel, towards the end of John chapter 1, shouts out to Jesus and says, Jesus, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Kings. So Philip's initial walk with Jesus was a very trembling walk. He wasn't completely sure about the origin and the context. He, he was calling him just another ordinary man. He's the son of Joseph. But then Acts chapter 8 throws light on a man who has been changed by the Holy Spirit. So we'd like to share two aspects today. This morning we're going to talk about spending time with our favorite book our self-time with our favorite book. This afternoon we're going to talk about how, when you're spending time with your favorite book, how do you and I stand up and stand unashamed of the gospel? See, just by wearing the shirt does not make you unashamed. Are you with me? Some people believe, if I can, you know, put a little cross in my pocket, I shall be safe. Others believe, if I can wear a cross around my neck, I'll be safe. I don't hear the Bible saying that. The Bible said, bear the cross. Don't wear the cross. So we're going to begin to understand that by wearing t-shirts and attending a Bible camp does not make us ashamed. It goes much deeper into it. So this afternoon we're going to see what does it take? What makes us unashamed of the gospel? We're going to spend time in the gospel message now. But what is going to make us unashamed like Philip was? He went from, a, from an unbelieving person, I'm not really sure about who Jesus is, to a person who's now preaching and baptizing and bringing people to Jesus. Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. Let's go there. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is... See, that's, that's one word you have to remember in, in the discussion this morning. Philip is told by the angel, go down south. Go through the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, but the way is desert. So, so if I would have told you now, go down south. So you would say, oh, south would be the, the southern Luzon Expressway. But that's not the desert. Is that the desert? No, it's paved roads. You have your three, four lanes on each side. You're, you're just gliding through. No. In this case, when the angel told Philip, you have to go down south, he said, remember, the way is not the paved way. It's the desert way. 
What I like about the fact is that verse 27 says, Philip arose and went. I don't see Philip questioning Jesus. I don't see Philip questioning the angel. Go down south. What's wrong with you? Can't I go through the expressway? Why do I have to go through the desert road? It's the broken road. Why should I have to go there? By the way, when you read the biblical context, you hear on all these desert roads, there were so many robberies, so many thefts, so many crimes, so many people hiding, thieves, the coits hiding in these places. Do you remember the story of the prodigal son? You remember the story of the prodigal son? Walking through the desert ways. You remember the story of the Good Samaritan? He found the man along the desert way. Along the desert way, the man was robbed and stolen. The prodigal son story is not, not related to that context. But the Good Samaritan is a, is a good example of, of that situation. He walks through the desert road and he gets robbed. So the desert ways were very dangerous ways. But notice Philip does not question. Because Philip knows that the message has come from the Lord. Does that make sense? The angel came from the Lord and gave a message unto Philip. And Philip did not question the message that came from the Lord. For some weird reason, we get excited about messages we receive from the Facebook. We get so excited about messages coming every time. Every new notification, I see people get very excited. They even stop breathing to check what's on. But for some strange reason, we don't take the time and spend time in this favorite book and the notifications and the messages that this favorite book presents to us. My friends, when the angel of the Lord presented a message to Philip, Philip did not doubt the veracity or the accuracy of the message. He listened to the word and without doubt or fear, he stepped forward into the unknown. Do you remember the children of Israel? They were at the Red Sea and God said, Moses, take them forward. Forward where? There's a sea above us Behind us are the enemies. Go beyond where? No, Moses, go forward. Do you know that Moses was not really supposed to touch the rod and part the sea? Did you know that? That was not supposed to happen. They were supposed to move in faith and the sea would have parted by itself. We have a very good example. When the children of Israel, again on a different context, when they're passing through the Jordan River which was flooding, God said, align yourself and march. So they begin to march, but Lord, march where? The river is flooding. No, march. So they begin to march. The priests are carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And the moment the priests begin to move into the flooded river, the moment their feet touch the, the, sea, the, the river that is flooding, the river parts into two and they walk on dry ground. When the Lord gives us a message from the favorite book known to history, we better believe it and step forward in it with faith. And so as young men and young women, I need us never to be downcast or downtrodden or broken hearted when someone leaves us or someone betrays us. Because the message from the Bible tells me that I will never leave you, neither will I forsake you. In times of distress and disbelief, I need us to turn to this favorite book and remember that my God has a message for me. And the message is that he shall be with me till the end of time. Don't let anyone take that message away from you. Don't let anyone delete that message from your life. Archive it and keep it with you forever. It's the message of God. An angel presents to Philip this message. He does not out, knowing that there could be danger of the desert way, knowing that I could get robbed and beaten and even killed. He says, I will go. He arose and went. And behold, what does he find? A man of Ethiopia and Europe. Before we talk about it, here's what I want you to know. Every time the Lord gives you a message, asks you to do something, prompts you and fills you to go in a certain direction, don't doubt him. Because he's got a ministry for you. He's got something planned for you. Did Philip know what he was going to encounter? Not at all. See, what I like about God is, he does not tell you everything. He will tell you when the time is right, but he will not tell you everything right now. Quite frankly, for if you knew everything, you would not follow his plan. For instance, if you knew, if you knew 
that all of you are going to die on June 13, 2014. And if I tell you that the message of God is that you will die on June 13, 2014 with an LRT that you will be riding it and it will derail and it will come off the track. If you knew that on June 13, you were going to ride an LRT and it's going to derail and fall off the track, what are you going to do? I like my friend's honesty. He says, I will not even leave my house. I will not even look at the LRT even on writing it. If we knew the whole picture, we'll never allow God's plan to be fulfilled. So not knowing everything is indeed a blessing and not a curse. Philip is sent out. He says, just go. We have a plan for you. Philip goes. He finds a man of Ethiopia. But the, notice, notice the identity of this Ethiopian. He says, he is a eunuch of great authority. That's what, that's what confuses me. He's a eunuch and of great authority. See, these are, these are two polarized statements. One is a eunuch. The other polarized statement is he's of great authority. And he's the treasurer, treasurer for Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. He's the charge of all her treasure. So he's the treasurer for the queen of Ethiopia. But notice this, he has great authority. But then he's a eunuch. Someone tell me who is a eunuch. Can someone, someone define a eunuch? Take care of the concubines. You know, something has to happen to the person before the person can take care of the concubines. Castrated. Now, this is what would happen. Two nations would go to war one with the other. And any army, any nation that lost, they were taken captives. Some of them would be selected out of the soldiers, out of the army, out of the general population. They'd be selected. All of them, some of them would be castrated and they would be kept in the king's court and their job was to take care of the ladies and the affairs of the king's court. So notice this, initially they are slaves and they're supposed to work out of many very menial job of taking care of the king's court. That, that, that's all they have to do. But notice in this case, he's a eunuch who has gained reputation. He has gained reputation and very quickly, he has been appointed as the treasurer of the queen of Ethiopia. Of all her treasure, he is the top of it all. But notice the next verse. Verse 28 says, by the way, let's, let's go back one more time. It says, verse 27, he is the child of all treasurer, a great Ethiopian, a great treasurer. He has come to Jerusalem to do what? You know what was so particular about Jerusalem and worship? Let me give you a, a modern day symbolism. Jerusalem was the general conference of the church. Does that make sense? Jerusalem was the general conference headquarters of the present, of the, of the then known church. So it was the top authority. If anyone wanted to know about God, if anyone wanted to go and meet top scholars regarding the word of God, everyone had to run to Jerusalem, the general conference. This man goes to the top place, the top place to worship because he's not an ordinary man. He's a, he's a treasurer or you could call him the, the vice president of finance for the whole country of Ethiopia. So do you think he's going to go to an ordinary place? No. He goes to the top place because he wants to know God and worship Him. But notice this. He's now returning and he's sitting in his chariot and he's reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. Firstly, the man returns from the top order of religiosity. He goes to the place where religion could be taught and Christ should have been felt. The top order place where we could know and understand the Bible. But this is sad. After having visited there where he could have learned about God, he instead turns back and he's on his way back but he pauses and in the middle of the, of the desert, you remember? It's the desert way where Philip finds him. In the middle of the desert, he pauses his chariot and he begins to read the Bible, particularly Isaiah the prophet. This is very strange. 
if there's one place where someone could have explained to him the Bible, it would be Jerusalem where the top religious leaders existed. But the man is in the middle of the desert trying to read the book of Isaiah, the prophet, all by himself. It tells me something. It tells me something. The man went to Jerusalem to worship. But in his, in his attempt and in his desire to worship the Lord, he entered the top order place, the biggest conference known, the highest of religious order that could be found in the nation. He goes to this place, but I'm getting a feeling that he did not find Jesus. When I read this text, it's giving me a feeling that he went to the most religious people, but he did not find Jesus in them. He found them very well dressed. All of them were wearing the same t-shirts. They were all looking exactly the same. And they were all fresh and looking nice, sitting in the church and worshipping God. But Jesus was missing. He came back. He was so broken. He thought he was going to experience Jesus. But when he comes back, he experiences nothing. And he, he wants to serve Jesus all by himself. And he begins to read the book of Isaiah all by himself. And he does not get it. He does not get it. Is it possible, my friends, that not much has changed even today? Is it possible? Is it possible that, 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 that ladies and gentlemen from the world would enter our churches and they would see all of us very well dressed and very beautifully seated, but Jesus would be missing from our midst? We would be reciting memory text and preaching sermons, but Jesus is missing from our lives. Is it possible? Is it possible that, yes, we have the 28 fundamental beliefs and we can explain Daniel and Revelation, the ten horns and the little horn, we can explain to them all these things, but Jesus is still missing from them. Is it possible that we can draw charts about the 2300 days and write 8027, 8031, 8034, 8044 and yet not have Jesus in our life? The man was broken. He was shattered. He thought, this is the place I was going to experience Jesus. This is the place where someone could have explained to me. See, you have to understand, the man goes from Ethiopia all the way to Jerusalem because he senses a need in his life. He realizes that he has all the money in the world. He's, he's, a, he's, he, he's, he's sleeping in money the whole time. He's the treasurer. He's got access to all kinds of money, but there is still a vacuum within his soul. I, you know, it is, it is an honor I have this morning to, to speak uh, to, to, to the younger generation that all of us are growing up to achieve something in life. I plead with you this morning, please don't ever seek the money of this world. You will, you will, you will gain the whole world one day and realize that I've lost my own soul. Uh, you will very quickly realize that I have it all and I still don't have anything. We want to get to a point as young and old alike that as we grow up in Jesus, all of us are able to sing that I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. What do we need this morning to be able to experience Jesus? How do we end the vacuum in our lives? We spend hours on Facebook, hours on internet gaming, hours with friends, hours on movies and music. And at the end of the day, when the computer is turned off, when the internet goes off, when there's a brownout, at the end when you plug out everything, there is still an emptiness within. How do we fill that void? How do we fill that vacuum that is within the soul? The man is reading. The book of Isaiah, the prophet, we want to learn how can we read the Bible and how can we learn that from this non-believer's experience. Notice this, verse 29, the spirit who has possessed Philip, by the way, we want to talk about that this afternoon. The spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this charity. Tells Philip, Philip, go near 
and join thyself to the chariot. Notice the specific command. Philip, go near and join yourself to the chariot. Read verse 30. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Philip is there. The Spirit prompts him, Philip, go near to this chariot and join yourself with this chariot. Verse 30 says that Philip, what did Philip do? Notice in the command and notice the execution. There are two different things. The command was one thing and the execution was a whole different thing. The command was Philip, just go near. But the execution was that Philip ran. Whether you know it, whether you believe it, whether you like it or whether you don't, today the Spirit is calling each and every one of you to move forward in life. The Spirit of what He has filled you with is asking you and pleading you to join yourself near someone's chariot, near someone's life, near someone's seat and tell them about Jesus. My question is, in the command and in the execution, what is the difference? The command to Philip was go near and join. And Philip's execution of that command was that he ran because he was excited to share the gospel. My question is, when the Spirit calls each and every one of us, I'd like to ask you, are you running? Are you walking? Are you sleeping? Or you have no idea? The Spirit is calling each and every one to move forward and join yourself to someone's life and tell them about Jesus. The question is, what's your response? The problem is not the command because the command has always existed. The problem is the response. What is your response? Notice this also. Philip is nearing the chariots. Chariots are driven by what? Horses. Chariots are driven by horses. Do you know what the name Philip means? Do you know what the name Philip means? Philip means lover of horses. Philip means lover of horses. A man whose name means he's a lover of horses. And when he sees, by the way, these are the finest of horses. Do you think the treasurer would bring ordinary horses? By the way, you have not even seen the horses that I'm talking about. There are horses that are as high as this wall. Okay? There are horses that, that can reach up to as high as this wall. There are some massive horses. So these are the finest horses, but notice this. As Philip approaches the chariot, as Philip approaches the chariot, his focus, his, 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 his speed of running is not caught up, is not distracted, is not destroyed by the surroundings of this rich man. Philip, when he reaches, he reaches the man, he's not distracted by the rims on the chariot. He's not distracted by the gold work done on the chariot because the man was a treasure, he's a rich man. He was not distracted by the horses whom his name means that he loves horses. He was not distracted by any of this. He was engaged in what God had asked him to do. I want to ask you, even when you come on God's mission to study, understand, and appreciate the Bible in a Bible camp, when you're sent by the Spirit, and then when you hear the voice of the Spirit, and you move forward, a good question to ask is, while being here, Am I distracted? Am I distracted by the surroundings of what is happening in the Bible camp? Are there distractions within the camp? Are there achens within the camp? Are there unbelievers within the camp? Are there distractions created within the camp to take me away from the mission that God has sent me to achieve in this Bible camp? There's much to learn from this non-believer's experience. Philip is not distracted by any of it. His focus is what he has to say to this man and notice what he's doing. He asked him, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch said, how can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Verse 32 says, the place of the scripture which he read was this. 
He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, like a lamb dumb before the shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. What is this eunuch reading? Reading the book of Isaiah, what particular aspect of the book of Isaiah is the eunuch reading? He is reading the prophecy of Isaiah. And the prophecy is about? He is talking about Jesus. He says, he will be led as a sheep to the slaughter. Like a lamb dumb before the shearer, he opened out his mouth. He is explaining the humility, the gentleness, the meekness, and the willingness to sacrifice himself that was found in Jesus Christ himself. Hint, clue, command, and answer number one. As students of the Bible, we have to spend ample amount of time in appreciating the prophecies of the Bible. I want you to take a look at this non-believer. He could have opened any book in the Old Testament. By the way, because the story is recorded in the New Testament, they did not have the New Testament at that time. They only had the Old Testament. The man could have read any other book, but he is specifically reading the book of Isaiah, and what he's reading is the prophetic material found in the book of Isaiah. It tells me, if a non-believer is attracted to prophecy, as believers, we ought to be masters of prophecy. Bible students, have to spend time in the prophetic material presented by Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel. We need to understand and share the prophetic message with hope and with vigor. He's reading all of these things. Verse 34 says, And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Uh, I beg you, who? Who is the prophet speaking about? Is he speaking of himself or is he speaking of another man? Notice verse 35. Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him the 2300 day prophecy. He preached unto him 1844 and the great disappointment. He preached unto him Ellen White. What did he preach to him? That's our problem. We are masters of doctrine. When someone enters the church, we can tell them, you, you're wearing jewelry, get out. You, you're not dressed right. You, this music is wrong. You, you're not wearing the right clothes. You, you're not uh, behaving right. We are very good with doctrine. And we're very good at presenting doctrines. We are failures at presenting Jesus. Because the Jesus you want to preach is not what people want to hear from the pulpit. The Jesus you want to preach is the Jesus people want to see in your life. So it's fun. It's fun to stand up here and preach a great message. But at the end of the message, people want to know what he preached about. Can I see it in his life? Because if the Jesus you're preaching is not the Jesus that's seen in your life, that sermon was a failure. You know, I like what I like what a great man. Do you know the name Mahatma Gandhi? He's a man from my country. I, I very much appreciate he made a statement once he said, My life is my message. Wow. He said, My life is my message. He says, Not what I spoke, not what I've written, not what I've said to others. My life. You look at my life and you will get the message, I think. And I, and I know that he borrowed it from the Bible. Bible Mahatma Gandhi was an avid reader of the Bible. And so he got this from the life of Christ. He emulated the life of Christ and then lived the life of Christ. And he said, if you want a message, look at my life. That's the problem with Bible students today. Because we're not spending time with our favorite book. There is no infilling of the spirit. There is no indoctrinating of the word of God. The result is we end up not being able to present Jesus. We can present other fancy ideas and great philosophies, but the simple Jesus we have trouble presenting. And that Jesus, the humility of Jesus, the forgiving nature of Jesus, the meekness of Jesus, the selfless service of Jesus, the servanthood of Jesus, this is missing in our Christian life. 
So it's not the words that attract people. It's the Jesus in our lives that people want to see. Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. It is my request to you that by the time you end this Bible camp, you better memorize this text. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15. Not just memorize it, but live this text in your life. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. Can someone stand and read it out loud?
in Jesus. Philip opened his mouth, did not tell him about the 28 fundamental beliefs, did not say, no, you have to become a Seventh-day Adventist. No, he said, I need you to know Jesus. I like what happens next. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, I want us to read this very carefully. The eunuch said, not Philip. The eunuch said, see here is water. What hinders me to be baptized? Philip said, if thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. He answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He commanded the chariot to stand still. They went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. You know, this is strange and this is rare. Here is a crusade. Here is a crusade where the preacher is not the one making the appeal. Are you with me? Here is a crusade where the preacher is not saying, so who would like to stand for baptism? This is a crusade in which the member attending the crusade is saying, Pastor, please baptize me. What's keeping me from being baptized? What's the difference? The difference are two. Number one, the man presenting the gospel message is filled and possessed by the Holy Spirit. That's number one. Second, the man did not present to him some fancy doctrine. He simply presented to him the love of Jesus Christ. And when he presented to him the love of Jesus, having been filled with the Holy Spirit, the man experienced Jesus in that short period of time and he said, I cannot live even one moment more without Jesus baptizing me right at this time. That's what needs to be happening with Bible students who are possessed by this Holy Spirit and filled with the Word of God. But I want us to go back to the experience of this eunuch. He's going from Jerusalem to Gaza. Can you see the two on the slide? He's going from Jerusalem to Gaza. A rich man. A rich man. But he takes the desert way. He does not take the paved road. Now he's a rich man so he can afford to pay the toll. Even if he takes the skyway, he can pay the toll, yes or no? But he does not choose to take the paved way. He says, I will take the desert way because it is a road less traveled. It is a road that is lonely. It is a road that is empty. It is a road that is not busy. And in the loneliness of the hour, I will study the word of God. I present to you a key in studying the scriptures that we can learn from this non-believer. For some reason, we think we can pack up Facebook and, and, and Instagram and, and Twitter and we can fit in all of these games and then on one side I can also put a Bible app and then I can use my iPad. For some reason we think in the busyness of life and in the caught upness of life, I can just try to manage my, 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 my all these games and all my Facebook and on one side I can all put in my Bible app as well and make it work. Whereas the Bible tells me, when you read the Genesis account, if God says, let there be, what's the first thing he said, let there be? Did he say, let there be darkness? So he did create darkness. And then he says, God divided the light from, since the beginning of time, God has operated by a fundamental principle, and the principle is division. You might not like to hear that, but that's a biblical principle. God has operated by a principle of division. He has always divided light from darkness. No wonder he said in the New Testament, what communion had light with darkness? What fellowship had righteousness with unrighteousness? You have to learn to separate. You have to learn to divide light from darkness in your life. He says, he says I have never wanted light and darkness to coexist together at the same time. I have never wanted evil and, and, and good to coexist and cohabitate at the same time. It has never been the plan of God. So God's children have to learn to separate, to divide light from darkness because they are two uh, completely morally opposite things. You know, a lot of my friends, a lot of my friends don't like my iPad. They like to look at it and say, wow, this is a nice iPad. But they hate it when they look at it. They'll go through it. Where are the games? Where are the games? I don't need games. 
things. So, so, what do you do to pass your time? So, I need something to pass my time? No, no, but you know, when you're bored, what do you do? I go to the Word. No, 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 but when you're bored, what do you do? I go to the Word. No, but see, when you're bored and you feel like playing, like, why would I want to play when I can spend time in the Word? When I know I don't have enough time, when I know that Jesus is coming soon, who told me I have enough time to play around? Does it make sense? You know, am I saying, sharing something that's beyond us? Jesus is nearer than we have ever known before. And yet we think we have time to play around. My good friend this morning was educating me about how these apps make so much money. About how these games make so much money. And we, and we think, we think we have time to waste on all these things. We think, we still think we have so much more time. When the eunuch, when the eunuch, a rich man, he says, I don't have the time to engage in the busyness of life. I want to go into the quiet of the hour. I want to take the long road. I want to take the desert way. I want to take the lonely hour and spend it with Jesus, my friends. Create a habit. Nurture a habit of spending your alone time with God. Learn to take selfies with your everything. Create this inborn nature within you to let go of all the darkness. Learn to divide. I tell you right now, go to James chapter 4 and verse 4. Any do I still have time? Five minutes. James chapter 4 and verse 4. Somebody stand and read out loud. James chapter 4 verse 4. Someone stand and read. Yes, please. Beautiful. The Bible says you are adulterers and adulteresses. Wow. That's a very, very strong statement and a very strong accusation. He's calling us adulterers and adulteresses. Is he talking about physical adultery? He's talking about spiritual adultery. What, why is this called spiritual adultery? Because our first love is and you have forsaken your first love and have gone against the love of the world. The love of what the world has to offer. The love of what the world is pleasing you with. And the Bible tells me that anybody who is in love with this world is an enemy of God. Anybody who is enjoying the things of the world, enjoying what the world is presenting, is declaring open war with God. Anyone who cherishes the world, who is enjoying too much the things of the world, I think that's why we haven't stopped singing that song. You remember the song? I used to sing it when I was little. Uh, some of you are too young. The song used to go, This world is not mine. I'm just a... If you're passing through, then act like you're passing through. When you came for Bible camp, did you bring your whole room with you? Did you bring your whole room? Some, some did, I know some people did. But did you bring your whole room with you? You brought the essentials, yes or no? You were not carrying excess baggage because it's going to burden you now. We're passing through this world. We're not staying here. So act like you're passing through. As you age, as you get married, as you get established, learn to act like you're passing through. Don't try to acquire big houses and big mansions and fancy churches. I don't believe in all of this. What are you gathering up for? You're paying for firewood. Because it's all going to get burned eventually. I want a bigger house so that it will be a bigger flame when the Lord burns it up. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Christians ought not to behave like this. The Bible is clear. Anybody who is in love with this world cannot be friends with God. So we do friend, do we do send friend requests to God? God, I want to be your friend. God, you know, I want to spend time with you. Will you please accept my friend request? He says, yes, I will accept a friend request. But after you accept him into your face, see that's why Facebook is a very weird phenomenon. I never agree with it. It's really, really messed up. You're friends with me, 
people who you don't even talk to. Do you know that? It doesn't make sense. So you call them friend, but you don't talk to them. How is that friendship? Some only accept friends to stalk them. Some will accept friends to track them. You know, where what are they doing? Who are their friends? Where are they going? What am I telling them? Am I telling the truth? We want to befriend God, but every aspect of our life is against friendship with God. So the Bible tells us, if you love the world, you cannot, you just cannot be friends with God. So what is the solution? James chapter 4 verse 7, same chapter. He gives us this, the problem in the chapter, gives us the solution in the chapter as well. Alright, together. Now notice this, we all know this text, but we've been reversing the equation. God presents to us an equation in James 4, 7, he says, Submit to God, the first participle of the equation. Resist the devil, the second participle of the equation. And the devil will flee from you. Here is our problem. We twist the first and the second participle. We, we change them about. We change the order and the chronology of how God has placed the equation. What do we do? We resist the devil, yes or no? Have you tried resisting the devil? Oh, you have not tried resisting the devil? They like him too much? <laughs> Have you tried resisting the devil? Yes. Does it work? Does it work? It works sometimes. Maybe once, twice, for one year, 10 years, 15 years. It will not always work. Here's the problem. You are a natural being. The devil is a supernatural being. Every time natural and supernatural fight, the natural always loses. But then what we need is something supernatural to fight the supernatural. And God presents the equation in the right order. He says you have to learn to submit to me first. If you learn to submit to me first, then you will have to resist the devil. But notice this now, when you submit to me, you no longer fight the devil. I fight the devil and I've already defeated the devil. Then when I fight the devil, he has no choice but to run away. And you thought the same boat runs fast. You will see the devil run away like no other in your life. If your lives are submitted to God, but then the problem goes back in verse 4. How can I submit to him when I still love the world? Does it make sense? I'll have to learn to detach myself from this world to be able to submit it and surrender and empowered by my Father in heaven. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he will free from we're beginning to learn something from this non-believer about the study of the Bible. Number one, get to know the prophetic material of the Bible. Non-believers are attracted to it. Believers ought to be craving, hungry, thirsty, and mastering the prophetic message. When you, when you want to spend time with God, learn to do it in the loneliness Learn to spend it, spend time on the desert ways of life. That desert way could be that lonely hour in the house when no one is there. See, when no one is there in the house, don't plan a party, plan your time with God. When nobody is around you, don't seek to get in and dive diverse into the world, but get to know God better in that desert time of your life. Learn to travel the road that is less traveled. Learn to go on pathways that offer you more peace than the noise and the crowd of the world. Get to the prophetic message. Learn to spend time with God in the loneliness of the hour. The best and the most prime times of the day are the early hours of the day. When you read the book Christ Object Lesson, chapter 12, ask him to give paragraph 1, Ellen White says that Christ would spend hours together in the night connecting himself to the Father. Every single night, hours together, in the early hours of the day, she says, the Lord would wake Jesus up from his slumber and want to spend time with him. There was a bond between the Father and the Son. They were having this relationship. Jesus, while he was the Son of God, he could not stay detected. He could not stay detached from his own Father. While he was the Son of God, he felt the need of prayer with Jesus. 
morning after morning, she says, Christ would come out of prayer having received a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. Every single day. Because you would not stop spending time with God in the quiet, lonely hours of the day. So I'm not saying don't pray in the afternoon. What I'm saying is learn to begin your day in the quiet hours having submitted yourself to God completely. And then all that you do in that day, all that you will share in that day, all that you will wear in that day, all that you will speak in that day will be prompted and directed and breathed upon by the Holy Spirit. As God's children, we need to learn to make use of the desert ways of life. Don't get too caught up in this fancy religion that is being presented these days. Get back to the basics of the Bible. Learn to become a student of the Bible. I completely disagree with some of the Bible plans. I completely disagree. The point is, I want to read the whole Bible in this year. What did you do today? I read 10 chapters today. I have a very simple question for those who read 10 chapters a day. What did you understand from the 10 chapters? Did you memorize even one text from the 10 chapters? What did those 10 chapters, how did they change your life? The Bible is not a storybook. It's not a novel. It's the Word of God. If you can take it even one verse a day and apply it and memorize it and share it with at least one more person, you've done good. So stop reading the Bible and start studying the Bible. The man who was a non-believer was not satisfied with the superficial reading of the Bible. He was reading it, but he says, I'm not satisfied. Philip, explain to me what this is saying. And that's the fourth part of our discussion this morning. And that is, every time you're on the desert way, every time you seek to spend time with God, God will send someone along the way to explain to you. Every time you spend that lonely hour with God, He will send an answer to your prayer. In your loneliness, in your brokenness, in your destitute nature, God will send an answer along your way. He might send a person like Philip, a man filled by the Holy Spirit, or He will send the Holy Spirit Himself. If no one can explain you, no pastor is there to guide you, no parents and others to lead you, the Holy Spirit Himself will hold you by the hand and take you through the stormy waters of life. I have a very simple appeal this morning. Is there anyone here who desires to become a student of the Bible? Is there anyone here who through this Bible wants to know the Word like they have never known before? They want to spend time in this favorite book, that is, if it is your favorite book. And you want to get to know it like you've never known it before. Anyone who wants to stand up and be able to present Jesus to friends, present Jesus to families, to workmates, to people out on the street, someone sitting in the jeepney, someone riding in the LRT with them. Can somebody here stand and say, today I want to be able to give a reason for what I believe. Anyone here? The question is simple. The command is simple. Our problem is always the response. If you stand, you don't stand for me. You don't stand for the Bible camp. You stand because you're standing in commitment, not to me, but in a commitment to the Lord, saying, Lord, today I want to get reconnected to your word. I want to plug into your word and experience the power that I've not been experiencing because I have not been spending time with you. I have not been taking the desert way. I've gotten too busy on the express ways of life that I've not taken the time to spend the lonely hour with Jesus in prayer and in deep study of the Bible. If that is any of your desire, if you're standing, for that very specific reason, and let us pray. Holy and righteous Father, we praise your holy name. What a joy it is, O oh Lord, when you move into our midst and change our lives. What a blessing it is, O oh Lord, that when we can open the scriptures and a small, simple story 
has the whole world to teach us. When a simple experience of a man filled with the Holy Spirit, and when we look at a non-believer, we get to understand that there is still something we can learn from this non-believer. Thank you, O Father, for the prophetic message that you have in the Bible. Thank you for allowing us to understand that we need to learn to take the desert road of life and spend time with Jesus. Thank you for enabling us to understand, O oh Lord, that we have to separate light from darkness in our lives. If we love the world, Lord, we cannot be friends with you. Help us to first submit to you, surrender our all to you by detaching ourselves from this world and allow only you and only you to take full control of our lives. I thank you, O Father, for giving me the privilege. In the sickness and in the weakness, your strength has been made perfect. Praise be to your name, O Lord, for presenting the message to your people who were hungry and thirsty for a word from you, for I did not have the message. Thank you, O Father, for speaking and clarifying the truth of your word. I present your people who now stand in this week as a commitment to give their lives to Jesus as they come to you in humility and meekness and fear of God, as they give and surrender their all into your hands and become diligent students of the word. Oh, Holy Spirit, I plead that you may rain down upon them as you did in Acts chapter 2 and fill them with your power and use them mightily. Take them forward out abroad and use them Glorify your name through them and lead people to the cross through them, O oh, Father. Is our humble prayer. Thank you so much for accepting us and enabling us to experience Jesus. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.